Exxon, you know, from the um, association. John Murphy, Nuvant, Martin Borgstrom, Yale New Haven, and Jeff Flax, who's backed by popular demand. And uh, this is a group that represents, what, 70 plus percent of all the um, hospital beds in the state. And uh, in a minute, I'll tell you what we are trying to accomplish with this team. I figure I should just give you the numbers and a little update just for five minutes. Um, we've added another 578 confirmed COVID cases out of uh, 2,700 tests. So we are ramping up our testing again. I think what's interesting in that number, 578 and 2,700, that's about 21% of the people we tested, tested positive for uh, COVID virus. That's a lot less than you'll see in some of the um, tougher sections in New York City and Queens and the such. Uh, and it's been sort of consistent for, um, you know, I'd say a week or so. Uh, in terms of the, where the confirmed cases are, it's interesting. Um, not happily, that um, New Haven County is now catching up quickly with Fairfield County in terms of where most of the, um, where uh, the new cases are being added at the, at the fastest rate. Um, frankly, I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I think I have surrounded by people who know lo a lot more about what these numbers uh, mean than I do. I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, today. We had another of our um, you know, weekly or bi-weekly um, video conference meetings with uh, the president, the vice president, and uh, their health care team, and the governors. And um, what was interesting to me is sort of obviously a lot of um, complaining from the governors about PPE and ventilators, and ventilators that were promised to them, and then they get rerouted or the order is canceled. The federal government sometimes is a thought that maybe they're getting some of the um, PPE that was promised for these different states. That's sort of a, a common refrain. A couple interesting stories, you, I thought. I mean, New Orleans, an unexpected hot spot there, high infection rate. The governor speculating probably Mardi Gras had a lot to do with the transmission there. As we think about people coming in and out of our state, you think about uh, what prompted uh, Mar um, uh, New Orleans. Colorado. Why Colorado? And the uh, governor, again, was saying the number of tourists from around the world, not just around the country, often coming in, in and around skiing, maybe uh, accelerated some of the pace there. Even Montana, some of the rural areas are saying, don't think this is just an urban virus. But we have um, very infected parts of Montana that um, maybe don't have a lot of people, but a high infection rate. Uh, I had the opportunity to, you know, add my two cents, which I shared with you a number of times, which is um, I asked them all to stop talking about New York City as being the epicenter of um, the COVID uh, pandemic in the United States. Think about the New York metropolitan area, and that includes Connecticut, and that's why Southern Connecticut right now, uh, reaching closer to capacity, has got to be at the top of the list, um, along with New York and New Jersey, when it comes to prioritizing um, PPE, when it comes to prioritizing um, the vents. Um, I guess a little bit of good news in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, what we can control, what we can't control. Um, I can tell you um, one thing I, I was happy with is the president extended um, another month, the social distancing and the uh, proper procedures. Uh, you know, that contradicted some of the language that had come out of the White House over the last few days. And it's so important that we speak with one voice. And it's so important to have the president speak to the group that really uh, follows his lead. And for him to say, social distancing, no more than 10 people, follow this for at least another month, I hope is something that reinforces a message that we all believe. I was with uh, Jim Ravella uh, earlier today. He uh, runs public safety for the state. And I asked, uh, Jim, are people respecting it? What happens at Home Depot? What happens at the gun stores? What happens around the basketball hoop at the uh, park? Are people following the social distancing? And he said, uh, by and large, we've been pretty impressed with uh, the fact. We've uh, had to go to a couple of barber shops, maybe, and uh, remind them that they are not on the essential list. 
We do have to go to some of the basketball courts on a warm day and remind folks that uh, this is unsafe behavior for you and your friends and your family. You've got to stop. In terms of things that we're trying to uh, corral with our friends here, um, we did get a sm another small delivery from um, the feds in terms of PPE. We got 111,000 N95 masks, 146,000 surgical masks, um, 50 um, ventilators were promised, seeing is believing, we haven't seen them yet. 111,000, 146,000 sounded pretty good until I was talking to these folks and you know, they're burning through each of their hospital systems. Hospitals probably 20,000 a day. So we have a long way to go there. Uh, I was very happy with the fact that we, um, we did our PSA asking for more health care volunteers. And in a few days, uh, we got another 1,000. So that's 2,000 folks who have stepped up, retired nurses, school nurses, those with some sort of a health care background, I hope are there to help out our hospitals as uh, demand increases and we get closer and closer to capacity. We've had good support from the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA. I think that's been a big step up uh, with help from the federal government. They have been touring a number of facilities around the state, trying to see where we can add on more facilities, more physical capacity, more beds. Uh, I think we're talking about the field house at Southern, which uh, we might be able to add 250 beds there. And these are like little hospitals in a box. Uh, they can tell you in terms of intermediate care, perhaps not folks um, uh, severe COVID, they are in the ICU, but it's expanding capacity um, for us in a broad way. Yale is helping out in terms of their space. The Tully Center um, at um, Southern is gonna be additional um, space, probably, I guess what, a couple hundred? I'm not sure in terms of capacity there. The O'Neill Center at Western. These are all going to be additional space that we're going to be able to take advantage of. But we're not going to be able to maximize taking advantage of the spare um, PPE that we have, the facilities that we have, the people that we have, unless we can coordinate that amongst our hospital systems in the most effective way possible. And that's why this health system response team is so, so important. We've been working together really closely. I cannot be more thankful now going on weeks. And uh, we got ahead of this curve early. And we're running like hell. And the virus is uh, right behind us. And that's why having this team every day, every hour coordinating, working with all of our smaller hospitals as well to make sure we allocate space, allocate people, and make sure that, look, if we're crowded in the south, maybe we've got some capacity in the northern part of the state. And it could be just the opposite in three or four weeks. This is what we're trying to do. This is how we're trying to plan for this. And this is why I'm really proud to be here with our response team. Jennifer, do you want to introduce our folks here? Um, sure, so I, I start. Um, I'm Jennifer Jackson. I'm CEO of the Connecticut Hospital Association. And I would just say before um, I, I turn it over to um, John Murphy, that um, it's important to remember that we, as the governor has talked about, we have an excellent system of hospitals throughout this state, and they are expert in caring for patients who have infectious disease, which obviously COVID-19 is. They are also expert at preparing for and planning for a large influx of patients. And as the governor talked about and we've talked about um, to you before, we have been planning for this for months the hospitals have been collaborating. They've been sharing best practices on how to care for the patients when we did start to receive them, which we now have. They've also been sharing best practices on how to maximize the critical care skills that they have because these patients are very ill, as Dr. Carter has talked to you about, and also conserving supplies because we are concerned about our supply of PPE. And now that we move into this next phase where we're going to see increasing numbers of patients, again, what we expected, what we planned for, um, we, this step that the governor is taking is an important one in continuing to cement and enhance the collaboration that we already enjoy. And I would just echo um, what the governor talks about actually every day in his press conferences that we have an able healthcare system, but the point is to make sure that we don't overwhelm the system. So we plan for the worst, so the hospitals are 
um, being very creative. They've already increased their capacity considerably. We're also with the um, governor's leadership identifying these other uh, spaces that will be available should we need them. But the most important thing is that everyone in this state, as the governor talks about, keep the demand down. We're expert, we'll take care of patients, but we need to keep the demand down. So folks need to comply with the mitigation measures, the social distancing, and all the other things that are put in place. It's vitally important for how we handle COVID-19 in Connecticut. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Murphy. I'm the CEO of New Vance Health, and I'm uh, delighted to be part of this team. And I, I would uh, echo the governor's remarks that we really are uh, part of a much larger team. There are many fine hospitals in this state led by talented people staffed by incredibly dedicated healthcare workers. What we're trying to do, as you all are, is figure out when is this surge going to hit, how big will it be, and will it outstrip our capacity to manage patients who need hospitalization. I think what this effort, led by the governor, has done has brought us together and not to look at surge as a static, geographically defined phenomenon, but to look at it more dynamically and take advantage of the fact that the virus is coming into the state at different places at different times. So to the extent that there is untapped capacity elsewhere in the state, we want to identify it, we want to take advantage of it, and that's really what this is about, actively sharing ideas, resources, models, personnel, and when one health system or one hospital has a defined need, we will collectively figure out how to address it. So I salute your leadership. Uh, I'm thrilled with the degree of participation that I'm seeing across the, the entire uh, healthcare community and the, the spirited cooperation and support of the hospital association. Marna? Great, thank you. I'm Marna Borgstrom. I'm the CEO of the Yale New Haven Health System. Uh, and I don't, I, it's hard to add um, a lot. The governor uh, has been terrific contacting us way in advance. Um, one of the things he said he found so important with um, Washington is that they speak with one voice and that people move forward. I think that's what you will find with the entire health care system in the state of Connecticut is we've been, we communicate a lot anyway, but we've been communicating a lot now and it's been real collaboration. Um, as the governor said, we have um, the lower Fairfield County hospitals in Greenwich and Stamford and Norwalk probably most impacted by this as a percentage of their total patient population. And they talk to each other every day, and they're talking about how to stand up other resources to uh, allow patients who aren't acutely ill to make way for patients who are. Um, we're going to be collaborating the same way between systems in the Bridgeport area with St. Vincent's and, uh, and uh, Bridgeport Hospital. And, you know, I think what we've all come together and done is said we have to be ready to take care of COVID-positive patients to the best of our ability. And at the same time, we need to continue the business we're in. People, unfortunately, are going to have coronaries. Uh, cancer patients need to continue their radiation therapy and chemotherapy treatments. So it, it's really we have to make sure that we're here for the people who have always needed us for the things that uh, have afflicted them as well as these COVID-positive patients. And we don't know exactly what the trajectory is, but we've done a lot of work to um, empty out our hospitals and our ambulatory clinics, create capacity so that we can be ready uh, for these patients. Jeff? Thank you. Uh, th this is leading. And what we're doing uh, at the direction of the governor uh, is we're continuing to take all necessary actions to support uh, and protect all the communities that we serve. Uh, today, uh, in, in our very first meeting, we, we made really three fundamental decisions. First, to accept the FEMA hospital uh, and bring it here to Connecticut, which will give us very meaningful capacity uh, with 250 additional beds. Uh, secondly, to stand up some ancillary facilities that we're working out the details around uh, but where it matters most, where we're seeing the greatest surge, where we need the greatest resources, and doing it in a coordinated fashion. Uh, and third is to, is to use all of the hospitals across the state. We can't look at this individually any longer, uh, and we really haven't now for a number of weeks. Uh, but we're one team, 
and I often describe it as we're not wearing individual uniforms, but we're, we're managing this crisis across Connecticut with all the health systems working uh, in, in partnership and really playing off one sheet of music. So a, as we work through this, this, this crisis, we're going to work, and we're doing it today, uh, but we're working to take patients uh, who are in some of the areas where they have greatest intensity and some of the greatest challenges, and we have other parts of the state who, who have capacity. And how do we work to use these resources, our people, our personal protective equipment, our capabilities, our, our equipment where we have things like ventilators uh, more efficiently? So I think this is an, another great advancement. Uh, the executive orders have been incredibly meaningful. Uh, the, the continued uh, partnership with the state relative to how we're working through regulation and the agility that the state continues to show that allows all the hospitals across the state to work uh, far more efficiently and to leverage the ingenuity that we have across our systems uh, is happening, and it's really happening because of the, the partnership with the state and then the coordination amongst health uh, system leaders across the state of Connecticut. So I do expect uh, that as we address this, this crisis going forward, uh, that we're going to be able to stand stronger, be more responsive, uh, and, and harness our resources more effectively as a result of uh, uh, this charge uh, and this expectation that the governor has set forward. I'll tell you in this job, but you issue directives, and you're never quite sure what happens in this building. I asked these people, what, 10 days ago, Jennifer, if we got a plan right now to increase our capacity by 50 percent. And they will have increased their capacity by 50 percent, I think, by the end of this week, certainly. And that is light speed. And uh, but we have a virus that's working at light speed as well. Any questions? nursing home patients that have tested positive. Um, what is the plan for those nursing home patients? And also, what would um, the Mohegan Sun Convention Center and the Connecticut Convention Center be used for? Well, on the nursing homes, you're right. Uh, as we've said before, they can be um, petri dishes in terms of a transmission of uh, the virus. And we're very careful, very early on. Uh, we got a little heat about this. No visitation there. And uh, yes, we've had um, incidents where people have tested positive in, um, in many of these um, centers now, nursing homes. The good news is we've got capacity in there, so we have empty wings where we can move people if they have to be quarantined in a separate area. We actually have a number of nursing homes that are unoccupied at this point, that with a modest upgrade, we can use them for, um, say, COVID patients to get folks out of the nursing home in total and into a separate place where they can be quarantined. We're very careful as we can be about testing, and uh, those nurses who go into nursing homes are going to be getting priority for testing and uh, PPE as that becomes more available. Is that the idea, though, to move them to quarantine the, the positive patients within, still within the nursing home? In a totally quarantined separate area, so absolutely. E either in that nursing home or in a separate nursing home that is, uh, you know, maybe nearby. What are um, the Army Corps of Engineers here, and, and what are they looking at the Mohegan Sun and the Connecticut Convention Center for necessarily? Well, they were looking at those for the four staff. Well, it's actually um, right now we're looking for patients. We're looking for beds. We're looking. These are um, you know hospitals, you know uh, mini hospitals that we can set up for intermediate care. And uh, there also is a dormitory space, or next to the Civic Center, there's hotel space. So nurses and doctors would have um, a place they could stay and actually get something to eat rather than going home during the peak of this. You want to add to that, anybody? I guess that's it. Where are we at with hospitalizations? Because that seems to be the big number. Do you know how long people are going to be on ventilators for? Okay, how long they come off? Because that, is it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? I don't know who has experience. We currently have 517 patients hospitalized in the state of Connecticut that are COVID positive. And we have several hundred more for whom we're waiting for the results of their test. But we presume that a good proportion of them will be positive. I'm sorry, then, I didn't catch the number, sorry. 517. And you know how long do we stay out of that for? Because I know some number here two weeks, maybe four weeks. Yeah, it's, uh, our average has been 13 days. Uh, and that's about half of what it was in China, which was typically seeing closer to four weeks. But we're at just about 13 days. On the PPE, can you take us through that? We've, we've gotten some conflicting statements, con conflicting things. In other words, yes, we have enough. No, we don't have enough. Uh, some hospitals seem to have enough. Some don't. 
Uh, can you take us through that uh, in Hartford and New Haven here, uh, um, among others? It's a dynamic process. Uh, so we're all scouring the globe, uh, working all day, every day, trying to secure as much protective uh, pr equipment we can for our staff. You know, again, the people working in our health systems today are heroes. Uh, the people working on the front line of providing this care uh, are doing extraordinary work, and we have to be certain that we have that PPE uh, available to them. So uh, all of our health systems are working tirelessly to do this. Uh, and candidly, the people who are doing the supply chain sourcing and logistics are absolutely critical to this effort. But in addition to what each one of our, our systems across the state are doing, uh, this, the state itself is working tirelessly on our behalf both at the federal level and at the state level. And as the governor announced, even the example of uh, getting the shipment that came in uh, just last night, uh, it, it, it's all important to us. The donations we're getting from companies remain critical. Uh, the industrial companies uh, from small, medium to large are all being extraordinarily generous during this time uh, with masks, with gloves, uh, and essential products. But uh, our efforts are, are really critical. We saw one very good example. The Ford Motor Company gave us 1,000 face shields uh, yesterday, really, and it was unsolicited. Uh, it's an effort by Ford Motor Company. They're retooling their, their uh, uh, factories to create face shields. We, we've seen OK Industries in New Britain also create a new, they're in the process of standing up a new uh, assembly line around creating face shields for us. Uh, so we're, we're seeing, again, great uh, opportunities for creativity, industrial comp companies repurposing themselves, but it can't happen fast enough. I think I, I speak for all of us in this regard. Uh, this is so critical. Any support we can get from the community is essential, uh, and we, we are in really significant need of more personal protective equipment as this uh, uh, crisis really continues to develop and evolve. Uh, no, it's very similar. Um, we, we, are, we have 306 um, in COVID inpatients in the Yale New Haven Health System. A um, little over 150 of them are in New Haven. And we have a number of suspected uh, COVID positive patients, and we are running through um, PPE at a fairly fast clip. We want to protect all of us as a, a primary goal of protecting our health care workers, because if our physicians, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, uh, the dietary people who deliver meals, if they aren't protected and they get sick, and this virus spikes, we will not have enough um, staff to take care of patients. So um, just as Jeff and John and Jennifer said, all of us are going, I never knew I had so many friends who know people in China who can get more PPE. I mean, we're, we're, everybody who calls and says, I think I can help, we say thank you, you know, and follow those up because you know, we don't know where we're going to be. Right now, we believe at the Yale New Haven Health System, across the health system, we have um, probably 10 days to two weeks of supply based on a usage rate that we have currently. Right. Is that the reason why we might have conflicting statements? In other words, you're using it so fast, you might make a statement last Wednesday, hey, we got enough. Uh, a week goes by and suddenly we don't have enough. If you have 50 more COVID positive patients, um, the precautions for those patients are much more pr uh, specific than they are for, you know, an, an average patient on a medical surgical floor. So you're going to be using a lot of N95 masks and a lot of surgical masks. And as Jeff said, face shields for, um, you know, certain procedures for people who are intubated. I believe your workers are sitting down. Boston hospitals are reporting today about 350 hospital workers between Beth Israel, Mass General, and some of the others are already positive. How many of yours? I don't know um, how many across the health system. I know that at Greenwich Hospital, which has been on the front line, they've had um, uh, about nine of their physicians um, test positive, including a number of emergency room uh, physicians, and they have a number of nurses out. I can't tell you the numbers in Bridgeport and New Haven. Um, but we are working really hard to protect them so that we don't see a lot of that. A different answer to your question, Chris. Um, we had a supply of PPE promised to the state of Connecticut, and at the last moment, FEMA said, uh, you have more than the three-day supply. Other places don't, so we're going to reroute your supply uh, someplace else. 
And we said, you have no idea how fast this is changing dynamically, how fast it's coming up from New York City and New Rochelle, and we don't know whether it's a three-day supply or what. So uh, don't make that judgment. So we're very careful about saying what we got. We planned ahead for this very thoughtfully, but the situation is changing on the ground by the hour. But I do think it's important to add to that that what this collaboration and this task force represents is the notion of it's not just my PPEs. Yes. Marna's willing to say, but, but here's what I have, or Jeff, or for that matter, anybody else. We, we are now actively sharing information that heretofore we wouldn't have, so that to the extent that there's a, a fire that needs to be put out, we, we can call on resources from elsewhere in the state who are actively committing to help us do that. So I think that's what needs to be underscored here is this degree of collaboration allows us to collectively address those problems where historically we would have addressed them in isolation. Well, the president has extended uh, his social distancing um, till April 30th and your executive order says schools, public schools must stay closed until April 20th. Um, is there any decision yet to extend that? My hunch is we get closer to April 20th, we're going to give our superintendents and parents plenty of notice. Talking to the experts I'm surrounded by here, I'd be really surprised if anything opened on April 20th. We'll give people notice that it's going to be extended. Uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, can you give us an update on, the, on uh, Norwalk Hospital? There was a, uh, a doctor who mentioned something along the lines that was starting to uh, resemble a war zone down there. Can you tell us how many, how many patients you have? What is, what is the status of uh, the situation at Norwalk Hospital? It, it changes by the hour. I think since 8.30 this morning, we've had half a dozen new COVID-infected patients. I, I don't know the specific numbers. I would venture to say Norwalk probably has uh, 75 COVID-infected patients and probably several dozen patients under investigation, people who might have it but were awaiting test results. I, I don't think, I mean, it depends on how you want to characterize this, Everybody is very serious about the work that needs to be done. Everybody's working very hard. Uh, we are repurposing parts of the hospital that are now ICUs that aren't, weren't ICUs a month or two ago. And again, in response to the governor's uh, strong suggestion that we increase capacity by 50%, we have all done that. So you have two things at work. One is you have more patients, more sicker patients. And to your question, we have some staff who've been furloughed or who themselves are unwell at home. So you have a, a thinner team working very hard. At, and there's a degree of anxiety that I think you have to understand, everybody understands. They are walking into an environment where they themselves could get sick. And I would uh, remind you, today is uh, National Doctors' Day, so uh, I would give a shout out to our physicians. But I certainly, sitting next to a nurse, want not to forget that nurses are doing a great job as well. <laughs> I think all of our healthcare workers really are doing a superb effort. Uh, it, it isn't a war zone, but it is a, a, a stressful, complex, ever changing environment. Governor, two questions here. I want to get your reaction to some of the measures being taken in Rhode Island by Governor Raimondo using the National Guard and stopping cars. Just some of your reaction to, to what she's decided to do in her state. Well, look, we're accomplishing the same thing in different ways. Um, you know, we have said no in certain terms, as has Governors Murphy and uh, Cuomo. Um, if you're traveling, stay home. And if you have to travel because it's essential and you cross that border, or you even go from Fairfield County to another part of the state that's a much less infected, uh, you should definitely self-quarantine. Uh, Jean has taken a little, she has one highway that goes into her state, you know, that's on I-95. So she has had state uh, police there or guardsmen, you know, looking for folks with out-of-state plates. We can't do that. I've got hundreds of roads and such coming in and out of Connecticut and the rest of the New York metro area, but the sentiment is the same. If you can, stay home. If you don't think you can, stay home. And if you absolutely have to on essential travel, um, make sure you self-quarantine and your neighbors and everybody else will be looking out for that. It's the moral imperative. It's the right thing to do. Just a second question here. We've been asking you for a week about extend, you know, mandating these health insurance companies to extend the 60-day grace period 
Uh, as of midnight tonight, a lot of employers who haven't paid their March bill, who use, utilize that 30-day grace period, are now going to be dropped for their April 1st. Yeah, other states are doing a, um, you know, 60-day grace period. And uh, I am requesting in the strongest possible terms that our health insurance uh, people, as well as, um, you know, the banks, give people that um, extension, give them that moratorium. Uh, look, this is not your everyday uh, garden variety recession. This is a, um, a, a medical shutdown. I, as governor, shut down restaurants. I shut down bars. I shut down non-essential services. These people, revenue was wiped out. We're doing what we can at the state level. We've um, extended the, the sales tax holiday uh, another, I think it's uh, 60 or 90 days. And I strongly urge the insurance folks as well as the banks. They are both meeting tomorrow, and I'm looking forward to a response. Maybe through an executive order, if, if, if you have the power to do so by tomorrow? We talked to some of our fellow governors about what they're considering there, and some governors have gone ahead. Governor, I'm sorry. Is there any indication... Is there any indication why there seem to be certain uh, pockets of the state that are more affected than others? I know, for example, Norwalk has had several hundred cases versus Bridgeport has only had 50 or so. Is that an indication of a lack of testing, or is it just not made it there yet? What's, what's going on? I can tell you from our perspective from prior uh, infectious disease outbreaks, uh, we, we often look at JFK International Airport and then 684 coming north. Uh, it, it, most of the diseases that we have tracked over the years follow that pattern out of the city and then come up to 84 or, or along a rail line, and the migration typically respects those travel patterns. And should we be hopeful that deaths don't seem to be increasing at the same rate that diagnoses are? I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Should we be hopeful that deaths aren't increasing at the same rate as the rate of diagnosis? I think the, the death rate typically is fairly constant uh, th throughout these pandemics, that as the infection rate rises, so too will the number of deaths, but not necessarily. The, the mortality rate is going to probably stay in, between 1% and 2%. Governor Grant, all day with the president, it's being reported that he said he hadn't heard anything about testing being a problem. Are you able to confirm that he said that, and do you agree with his assessment? Have things here in the state improved? I think uh, we are doing better on testing, uh, certainly than we were, um, you know, a month and a half ago, and it's definitely still a problem for many of our states. We need more testing. I was I was asking the professionals here about the uh, the new Abbott testing uh, procedure, where they're going to be doing what 50,000 a day, and it's a possibility you can get a response within 15 minutes. That could be a j game changer if that really works. Can you tell us what the status is at Greenwich Hospital? Um, I believe that's in the, in the Yale network. Yeah. Greenwich, uh, as of this morning, um, I have my numbers here. I give it, if I looked uh, at them uh, for Greenwich, they're probably at around 85 to 90 COVID positive inpatients, which for a hospital of that size is pretty significant. And I think to Dr. Murphy's point about it following um, the uh, patterns out of New York, um, it, Greenwich is it, it, a logical uh, place. They have um, uh, a number of patients innovated. Um, they are co creating capacity. They are working with Stanford Hospital. The governor mentioned that they're going to take the Tully Center, which is uh, a facility owned by Stanford Healthcare that's been um, mothballed, and they're going to turn that into a respite care, post-acute care facility for both Stanford uh, and Greenwich. Um, and, you know, the, the staff there is managing a very difficult situation with incredible grace and skill. And, you know, I think that they will continue to do that. But uh, they, Norwalk, uh, Stanford, are really on the front line. As Governor said, we also have a cohort in New Haven, about 155 of our 306 COVID inpatients are in, at Yale New Haven Hospital. And we've emptied out the top three floors of the Smilo Cancer Hospital, 12, 14, and 15. Uh, they're all negative pressure rooms, moved those patients elsewhere, and have created additional intensive care unit capacity by doing that in New Haven. And do you have any 
uh, numbers that percentage wise are are half the people that the numbers that you mentioned in Greenwich are they from New York or spilling over the, the I don't I, I I don't have those numbers no hey, governor do you know where our um, our ventilators were rerouted to I have no idea I mean they, they have their um, statistical analysis that shows where there's uh, need and otherwise um, we had planned accordingly for that. Uh, and do we know, I guess, what is the survival rate of somebody who ends up on a ventilator? Uh, John, do you know that? I, I tell you that our experience has been, um, it's, it depends on how old you are. Uh, if you're above 80, the mortality rate in general is about 17 percent, where it's probably half that if you're 70 and half that if you're 60. But if you get on a, a ventilator and you're over the age of 80, there's a significant mortality associated with that. What, what is the latest on the homeless? Are you considering moving them into hotels? Uh, obviously, in the homeless shelters, as you know, uh, that is very close quarters, and they probably shouldn't be there. Or, so yeah, we are definitely decongesting, as they say, the homeless shelters. Again, people living in very close proximity. Uh, we're getting them a smaller group, hotels um, and other facilities where we can move folks. And certainly anybody who's tested or was in contact with somebody who was tested, we're getting them separated. It's just dangerous as it can be for those folks not to be, um, you know, thoroughly quarantined and taken care of in a separate facility. Hey, look, um, Paul wants me to wrap this up. But uh, <laughs> I just want to say something. Um, there's what we control and there's what we don't control. And I think the folks I'm sitting up here with is the best team I could imagine going to battle with. And they represent one of the best health care systems in the world. And they have done everything we have asked, and I hope we've done everything they have asked as best we can to stay ahead of this. And I think in terms of what we control, um, I'm feeling really good about where we are. But I need the experts in terms of what we don't control, what's the unexpected, because that's what could, um, uh, you know, take us back a little bit. Right now, we're ahead of the curve, and I'm doing everything I can to stay ahead of the curve. Thanks for being here, you guys.